Congressman Ron Paul. And the former U.S. Senator. I'm Congressman Ron Paul from Texas. I'm the champion of liberty. I am the only one that has offered a balanced budget in, in a sincere method. Uh, and also, I present the case for fr a free society as being the best defense for peace and prosperity. Congressman Paul, you called his plan dangerous today. Uh, oh, it is, because it raises revenues, and the, the worst part about it is it's regressive. A lot of people that have, aren't paying any taxes, and I like that. I don't think that we should even things up by raising taxes. So it is a regressive tax, so it's very, very dangerous in that thing, and it will raise more revenues. But the gentleman asked the question, he didn't even ask what we're talking about. He asked the question, what are you going to replace the income tax with? And I say nothing. That's what we should replace it with. But I do want to make a point that spending is a tax. As soon as the government spend money, eventually it's a tax. Sometimes we put a direct tax on the people, sometimes we borrow the money, and sometimes we print the money. And then when prices go up, like today, the, the, uh, the uh, wholesale price index went up 7% rate. And if you look at the free market, the prices are going up 9 and 10 percent. So that is the tax. So spending is the tax. That is the reason I offered the program to cut $1 trillion out of the first year budget that I offer. Mr. Kane, 30 seconds. Once again, unfortunately, none of my distinguished colleagues who have attacked me up here tonight understand the plan. They are wrong about it being a value-added tax. We simply remove the hidden taxes that are in goods and services with our plan and replace it with a single rate 9%. I invite every family to do your own calculations with that arithmetic. Governor Romney, uh, you have your own 59. Obamacare, we actually have a Twitter question about it too. It was a question left at CNN Debate. If Obama's health plan is bad for the U.S., what is the alternative and how will you implement it? Congressman Paul, is there any aspect of Obamacare that you would like to keep, whether it's keeping uh, kids to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26 or no pre-existing conditions? Uh, I'm really not, because he's just adding on more government. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about medicine, but it seems to be uh, talking about which kind of government management is best. But our problem is we have too much. We've had it for 30, 40 years. We have Medicare. We have prescription drug programs. We have Medicaid. And what we need, I mean, there's a pretty good co uh, support up here for getting rid of Obamacare because it's a Democratic proposal. And we want to opt out. I think we'd all agree on this. But if you want better competition and better health care, you, you should allow the American people to opt out of government medicine. And, uh, and the way to do this is to not de-emphasize the medical savings account, but let people opt out, pay their bills, get back to the doctor-patient relationship. There is inflation worked into it. When a government gets involved in an industry, prices always go up. We have tort laws to deal with, and uh, we need more competition in medicine. But the most important thing is letting the people have control of their money and get it out of the hands of the third party. As soon as you go to the government, the lobbyists line up, the drug companies line up, Line up, these insurance companies line up, and even with Obamacare, the industries, the corporations get behind it and affect the outcome, and already insurance premiums are going up. Herman Cain, same question. Congressman Paul, there are some Latino voters who believe that some of these strong anti immigration laws, anti illegal immigration laws, are actually anti Latino laws. What do you say to them? Well, I think some people do believe that. I think offense is symbolic of that, and I can understand why somebody might look at that. But when we approach this immigration problem, we should look at the incentives, and that are the mandates from the federal government saying that you must educate and must give them free education. You have to remove these incentives, but uh, I don't think the answer is a fence whatsoever. But in order to, uh, to attract Latino votes, I think, uh, you know, too long this country has always put people in groups. They penalize people 
people because they're in groups, and then they reward people because they're in groups. But following up on what Newt was saying, we need a healthy economy. We wouldn't be talking about this. We need to see everybody as an individual. And to me, seeing everybody as an individual means their liberties are protected as individuals and they are treated that way and they're never penalized that way. So if you have a free and prosperous society, all of a sudden this group mentality melts away. As long as there's no abuse, one place where there's still a lot of discrimination in this country is in our court systems. And I think the minorities come up with a shorthand in our court system. Herman Cain, the, um, the 14th Amendment allows that anybody... I'd like to address uh, the issue that the, the gentleman brought up, which is what are we going to say to the Latino community? And not one person here mentioned the issue of family, faith, marriage. Uh, this is a community that is a faith-filled community, that family is at the center of that community. I disagree in some respects with Congressman Paul who says, you know, the country's founded on the individual. The basic building block of a society is not the individual, it's the family. It's the basic unit of society. And, and, the, and the Latino community understands that. They understand the importance of faith and marriage. They understand that bond that, that, that builds that solid foundation and, and that inculcation of faith and religious freedom. And I think the Latino community knows that's at stake in this country. Paul, you were referenced directly, 30 seconds. Well, I would like to explain that rights don't come in bunches. Rights come as individuals, they come from a God, and they come as each individual has a right to life and liberty. But I might add about the border control and the, and, and the uh, Latino vote, is we, we lack resources there. I think we should have more border guards on and a more orderly transition and run it much better. But where are our resources? You know, we worry more about the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. We need to bring the guard units home and the units back here so we can have more personnel on our border. We have a question in the audience. Uh, we have a question in the audience. Uh, My question for you is, do you support opening the National Nuclear Repository at Yucca Mountain? Well, you oppose this. Yes, yes, I've, I've opposed this. We've had votes in the Congress. There was a time when I voted with two other individuals, the two congressmen from uh, Nevada. And I approach it from a state's rights position. What right does 49 states have to punish one state and say, we're going to put our garbage in your state? I think that's wrong. But I think it's very serious. I think it's very serious, but quite frankly, the government shouldn't be in the business of subsidizing any form of energy, and nuclear energy, I think, is a good source of energy, but they still get subsidies, then they assume this responsibility, then we as politicians and the bureaucrats get involved in this, and then we get involved with which state's gonna get stuck with the garbage. So I would say the more the free market handles this, and the more you deal with property rights, and no subsidies to any form of energy, the easier this problem would be solved. Governor Romney, where do you stand on this? Yeah. Congressman Paul was right on that. Um, I, I, I don't always agree with him, but I do on that. Uh, Congressman Paul, you've been... <laughs> Congressman Paul, you've been critical of Governor Romney for, for holding fundraisers with, with Wall Streeters. Uh, do you think he understands what the protest is about? Do you understand? Well, I think uh, Mr. Cain has uh, blamed uh, the victims. Uh, there's a lot of people that are victims of this business cycle. We can't blame the victims, but we also have to point. I'd go to Washington as well as Wall Street, but I'd go over to the Federal Reserve. Uh, <laughs> They, they create the financial bubbles, and you have to understand that. You can't solve these problems if you don't know where these bubbles come from. But then when the bailout came, and supported by both parties, you have to realize, oh, eight Republicans were still in charge. So the bailouts came from both parties. Guess who they bailed out? The big corporations, the people who were ripping off the people in the derivatives market. And they said, oh, the world's going to come to an end unless we bail out all the banks. So the banks were involved, and the Federal Reserve was involved. But who got stuck? Stuck. The middle class got stuck. They got stuck. They lost their jobs and they lost their houses. If you had to give money out, you should have given it to the people who were losing their mortgages, not to the banks. Mr. Kane, do you want to respond? He referenced you, so if you want to respond, you have 30 seconds. All I want to say is that Representative Paul is partly right, but he's mixing problems here. It's more than one problem. Look, the people, the bank, yes, the banks, and the, the businesses on Wall Street, yes. The way that was administered was not right. But my point is this. What are the people who are protesting want from bankers on Wall Street? 
to come downstairs and write them a check? This is what we don't understand. Take, go and get to the source of the problem is all I'm saying. I got to give and you 30 the seconds House. and then we'll go to Governor Romney. Uh, yes, uh, the argument is it's uh, the program was okay, but it was mismanaged. But I work on the assumption that government's not very capable of managing almost anything. So you shouldn't put that much trust in the government. You have to you have to trust the marketplace. And when the government gets involved, they have to deal with fraud. And how many people have gone to jail either in the government, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, that participated in this? And nobody suffers the consequences. All these investigation, and yet the people who lose their jobs and lose their houses, it's their fault, according. That's why Time. they're on Wall Street, and we can't blame them. We have to blame the business cycle Time. and the economic policies that led to this disaster. Governor Romney, you, you, you originally called the... <laughs> Congressman Paul, you just proposed eliminating the Departments of Commerce, Education, Energy, Interior, Housing, and Urban Development. You say it'll save a trillion dollars in one year. You're proposing a 15% cut to the Defense Department. Can you guarantee national security will not be hurt by that? I think it would be enhanced. I don't want to cut any defense. And you have to get it straight. There's a lot of money spent in the military budget that doesn't do any good for our defense. How, do, how does it help us to keep troops in Korea all these years? We're broke. We have to borrow this money. Why are we in Japan? Why do we subsidize Germany? Uh, and they subsidize their socialized system over there because we pay for it. We're broke. And this whole thing that, that this can't be on the table, I'll tell you what, this debt bubble is the thing you better really worry about because it's employed on us right now is worldwide we are no more removed from this than the man in the moon is going to get much worse and to cut military spending is a wise thing to do we would be safer if we weren't in so many places we have an empire we can't afford it the empires always bring great nations down we spread ourselves too thinly around the world this is what's happened throughout history and we're doing it to ourselves the most recent empire to fail was an empire that went into, of all places, Afghanistan. They time. went broke. So where are we in Afghanistan? I say it's time to come home. Time. We just have a, a Twitter question. Uh, to, uh, to address Congressman Paul's answer and, and the other answer on, on military spending, uh, I would absolutely not cut one penny out of military spending. The, the first order of the federal government. The only thing the federal government can do that no, nobody, no other level of government can do is protect us. It is the you, you were referencing that answer, 30 well, seconds? I, I think we're on economic suicide if we're not even willing to look at some of these overseas expenditures, 150 bases, nine, 900 bases, 150 different countries. We have enough weapons to blow up the world about 20, 25 times. We have more weapons than all the other countries put together, essentially. And we want to spend more and more. You can't cut a penny. I mean, this is why we're at an impasse. There's, I don't. I want to hear somebody up here willing to cut something, something real. This budget is in bad shape, and the financial calamity is going to be much worse than anybody ever in, in, in uh, you know, invading this country. Which country are, is? Are they going to invade uh, this country? They can't even shoot a missile. We, at we have a question in the hall that it gets it gets to your uh, gets to your question. The call on foreign aid. Yes, ma'am. The American people are suffering in our country right now. Why do we continue to send foreign aid to other countries when we need all the help we can get for ourselves? Congressman Paul. On, on foreign aid, that should be the easiest thing to cut. It's not authorized in the Constitution that we can take money from you and give it to particular countries around the world. To me, foreign aid is taking money from poor people in this country and giving it to rich people in poor countries, and it becomes weapons of war, essentially, no, well, no matter how well motivated it Congressman is. Paul, so would you often, cut aid to Israel? I would cut all foreign aid. I would treat everybody equally and fairly. And I don't think aid to Israel actually helps them. I think it teaches them to be dependent. We're on a bankruptcy court, of course. And, uh, who, and look at what's the result of all that foreign aid we gave to Egypt. I mean, they're, they're dictator that we pumped up. We spent all these billions of dollars, and now there's a more hostile regime in Egypt, and that's what's happening all around Israel. That foreign aid makes Israel dependent on us. It softens them for their own economy, and they should have their sovereignty back. They should be able Time. to deal with their Congress neighbors at their own should will. Should we cut foreign aid to Israel? 
This, if I could, very quickly in the time that I have left, the question they ask about foreign aid. My approach is an extension of the Reagan approach, peace through strength, and which is peace through strength and clarity. If we clarify who our friends are, clarify who our enemies are, and stop giving money to our enemies, then we ought to continue to give money to our friends like Israel. You have 30 seconds, Congressman Palmer. Oh, yes. I gotta go. Matter of fact, I don't want to make a statement. I want to ask a question. Are you all willing to condemn Ronald Reagan for changing weapons for hostages out of Iran? We all know that was done. That, yeah, that, what? That's not, uh, Iran was a sovereign country. It was not a terrorist organization, number one. That's, oh, they that's, were our that's, good friends. Back they're not our good friends, but they're, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're a sovereign country, just like the, the Palestinian Authority is not he, the good friends he, he, of Israel. He negotiated for hostages. Uh, there's, there's a role, for, we negotiated with hostages with the Soviet Union. Now, we've, we've negotiated with hostages, if, if, depending on the scale, but there's a difference between releasing terrorists from Guantanamo Bay in response to a terrorist they're demand. They're all suspect. Then, they're not terrrorists. You haven't convicted them of anything. Then, then negotiating with other countries where we may have an interest, and that is certainly a proper role for the United States we to we got to take a quick break. Can, I, I do want to give Speaker Gingers 30 seconds, and then... Yeah, uh, just, just very straightforward. Cliss and I did a film on Ronald Reagan. There's a very painful moment in the film when he looks in the camera and says, I didn't think we did this. I am against doing it. I went back and looked. The truth is we did. It was an enormous mistake. And he thought the Iranian deal was a terrible mistake. We're going to take a short break. Uh, our debate, though, continues on the other side of the break, so stay tuned.